So welcome everybody to the 2022 Recreational Trails Program Grant Workshop. We are with the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation in the Division of Planning and Recreation Resources. Um, I am Crystal McKelvey. I'm the Recreation Grants Manager here in PRR, overseeing RTP, Land and Water Conservation Fund, and some other programs. And I'll let Kelly introduce herself, please. Yep. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Kelly Seaton. I'm the Recreation Grants Coordinator. So I work with Crystal on, on most of the, the grant programs she works on, but specifically with RTP, I process a lot of the paperwork and I'm kind of the first point of contact for the grant recipients. So uh, as you move forward in this process, definitely expect to, to hear a lot from me. And you can um, contact either of us at this email address at the bottom, recreationgrants at dcr.virginia.gov. All right, so we do have um, a pretty full agenda for this workshop. Um, as I said, this is already being recorded and the video afterwards will be posted. Our agenda for today is to talk about an overview of the program and the funding available, talk about project eligibility, the process for applying for the funding, also what it's like to administer the projects once you're um, authorized to move forward, and then this is a match reimbursement program, so we're going to discuss some of the procedures involved with that as well. We will stop periodically between sections for questions, and you're free to use the chat box feature anytime to, to type those in. Um, that's usually the easiest way for us to, to filter the questions, and then um, Kelly will read them out and we'll do our best to answer them. So the Recreational Trails Program Overview, the purpose of this program comes through the Recreational Trails Program FAST Act, which is Fixing America's Surface Transportation. Um, so this funding is available from the Federal Highway Administration, U.S. Department of Transportation. The purpose is to provide, expand, and improve public recreational trail opportunities for both motorized, diversified, and non-motorized use. Um, this program started in Virginia around 1993, and we have over 300 projects that already um, came to fruition, totaling more than $300 million in that federal RTP funding. For this grant round, um, the apportionment for Virginia from Federal Highways is $1.5 million um, of RTP funding available. Per the regulations, we have to split that those funds between three separate categories, um, and that's a 40-30-30 split. So 40% of the funds must be used for diverse trails, then 30% must be used for non-motorized trails like single use, and then 30% for motorized use. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, this is an 80-20% match reimbursement federal grant. So we do have to meet all federal requirements, and um, for the full 100%, we're going to get into this some more, um, but you can get up to 80% match of el eligible costs. So for this grant round, the minimum funding request for your project is $50,000. And when you do the 80-20 math, that means that your total project cost must be at least $62,500. And then you can see here that we have different maximum requests, and that's based on the available funding and the number of projects to administer. All right, and so with the amount of funds we have available in and dividing between the categories, it doesn't doesn't leave a ton of funds to distribute. So this is a very competitive grant. Um, we expect to receive a, a good number of applications and ultimately award, as listed on the screen here, one to three grants in the motorized and then two to three each in the non-motorized single use and the diversified categories. Historically, um, the motorized category is not as competitive in Virginia because there aren't as many competing uses as maybe some other places with more winter sports availability. Um, but we still have uh, generally received many more applications than we can fund. Um, and we'll get into the reimbursement procedures a little more as we go through this presentation, but just noting that all the payments on the grant are made on a reimbursement basis. So you do have to incur all those costs up front, and then as you go along can submit periodic reimbursements, and then the grant will, will pay up to 80% of those expenses back to you um, as you go along, but you have to be able to front that cost to begin with. And, and then again, we'll, if uh, Crystal, you could go to the next slide, we'll talk about this matching share. 
So that matching share, um, we say it's a, a kind of minimum of 20% of your project costs that you're ultimately responsible. So kind of the easiest way to think of this is if you were paying for your whole project, you know, out of pocket and it was a hundred thousand dollar project, then you're going to be on the hook for 20,000 of that. And the grant would reimburse you 80,000. Now you don't have to kind of use your matching share in, in cash. There's a lot of other elements that can be eligible through RTP um, listed on the, the slide here. So force account labor. So if you have employees of your entity actively working on this grant project, either through um, administration or through, you know, on the ground field work or through the design and permitting, things like that. Um, and also beyond that, any donations or volunteer labor that's going into to completing the project. Those are all items that are eligible for, for the matching share. It just requires a little more paperwork when we're submitting the reimbursements um, because, it's a, because um, you may kind of consider it as you are getting a donation on top of your hundred thousand dollar project, but we actually have to to quantify the value of that donation, and it increases the the total cost of your project. So every time you process a reimbursement with us, we're, we have to show that that either through these different matching items or through extra cash spent, you know, you reach that that full project cost, and in the re, the grant is reimbursing you eighty percent. Um, with any of these, the, the big thing to remember is just to make sure that if you're considering any kind of non straight cash uh, match items to put them in your application, um, because that triggers for us to, to know that we have to make sure we have documentation in your grant agreement. Um, there's a lot of eligible things that that can be used, but they have to be outlined in the project agreement that federal highways signs. Um, we can't approve them kind of after the fact. All right, next slide, please. So for 2022, our schedule here, we're already in, in the midst of the grant round. Hopefully you've been able to review the application materials. Um, May 26th is when the applications are due. We ask that you submit those all via email to um, the email that was on the first slide. We'll show it again, recreationgrants.dcr.virginia.gov. That's a, a shared email that Crystal and I have both have access to. So if one of us happens to be out that day, um, we'll both be able to monitor that and, and get you a confirmation in as, as the applications come in. And then in June, we'll, we'll do a quick review of them, make sure all the applications are eligible and forward them to our advisory committee who review all the applications and score them and rank them. And then our committee comes together to discuss the projects and recommend projects for funding. And then from there, we, Crystal and I um, will reach back out to the folks that were recommended and follow up if we need any additional paperwork, schedule site visits, and through that process, then also contact folks if you were not selected this round and, and also provide an opportunity for feedback um, to help you hopefully be selected in the next round. And the last point there in September is when the projects, we expect them to be authorized by the Federal Highway Administration. Um, so that's kind of the, the trigger date of when you can actually begin work on the project that you're going to be submitting for reimbursement. All right. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to applicant eligibility, there is a pretty wide variety of applicants that we do receive and are eligible. So as you can see, that includes local governments such as um, towns, cities, counties, um, PDCs as well, state agencies are eligible applicants, as well as federal government agencies. If you are part of a federal government agency, there's, there's a caveat about um, federal funds, total project cannot exceed 95%. Um, so if you are a federal government interested in applying, um, I'd recommend that you reach out and, and talk to us about your budget options. Tribal governments are also eligible. And then public recreation government entities, especially related to park authorities, um, are often applicants as well. And then nonprofits are eligible for RTP funding. And this year we have a bit of an update that you must have a letter of support from the local government body that you're within for the project and the property owner, um, making sure that everybody's on board with what is planned. And then we do have multiple projects going on already, um, current existing RTP projects. And so if you are an entity that is active already with an RTP grant, 
um, I recommend you reach out because if your project's on track to be completed by the end of this calendar year for the non-motorized use and diversified categories, you can apply, but um, just reach out to us and, and let us know what your situation is and we can talk through that. So for eligible project types, this program is really great because it can help fund reimburse both the preliminary engineering phase and the construction phase of projects. The key to remember though is that the end result must be a constructed trail and or trail facilities and amenities. So under preliminary engineering phase, these items are, are eligible with proper documentation for reimbursement um, and should also be itemized on your proposed budget for the application. Um, so the NEPA review, this is federal, so we do have to go through that process of the National Environmental Protection Agency um, Act process. And we have environmental review guidance on our website available. Uh, you do, part of that is a public comment period, so the advertisement of that is eligible. And then the process involved for permitting, design, engineering, bidding, if that's all done um, with proper documentation and invoices and proof of payment, then we can also um, show that for reimbursement. And then when it comes to the construction phase, uh, we can, the RTP program can fund new recreation trails, restoration or rehabilitation of existing trails, trailhead facilities, water trail facilities, and there's also the possibility for acquisition. But if you're considering a right-of-way acquisition for a trail, I would recommend reaching out to us earlier than later in this process um, to talk about the timing of that and, and the requirements for appraisals and such. Um, all projects are authorized as a three-year period, so please consider that in your timeline of how much time you'll need for PE versus construction. Some conditional project elements that sometimes we get asked about is that RTP is not designed for sidewalks or bike paths for transportation. There are some options for that if it is a necessary project to complete a link among other longer trail phases. Um, most of the time, the VDOT program, Transportation Alternatives, is a good option for sidewalks and this kind of work for transportation. Also, as I said earlier, this must result in a completed trail element, so it is not for just the planning and scoping of, of, of your trail project. The final reimbursement will be processed after a site visit to confirm that the scope of work as planned was completed. Um, and then I added a point about boat launches. We do have more and more applicants for water trails, and that can both be motorized if you're doing a boat ramp for small boat launch or non-motorized if you're doing a project that is, for example, a kayak launch that's along a water trail, then that is typically eligible as well. But just remember that for all work within waters, you must obtain the necessary permits from the Virginia Marine Resource Commission, DEQ, and Army Corps of Engineers if, if eligible. So do consider what the permitting process would be involved with that kind of work. And then as for ineligible project elements, um, some items that are not eligible for reimbursement includes feasibility studies, food related for travel or group meetings, gifts cannot be eligible, and legal fees. Um, some options are available for that. And again, that would be something that we would, would want to talk over. But um, if it came to a necessary appraisal or um, review of agreements, we, we can talk about that separately. Um, and then it's very important that you have a very clear, defined scope of work that details your project elements that you want to complete, because if at the end you add some elements that were not initially authorized by federal highways, then that will likely not be eligible as well. We can do amendments along the way if you have project scope changes, um, but just try to be as, as clear about that during your application as possible. So I do realize that's been a lot of information, and so we're going to pause and see if there's any questions in the chat box. You're welcome to enter those anytime. Have there been any in Kelly? 
Yeah, I'll start. There's one in now. Um, it was just asking for some clarification on what we mean by diverse in the, what the diverse category means. So does that mean hike, bike and horse trails or something else? Um, yes, it just means for multiple user types. So that can be a variety um, of, of different options. And um, like the example that you just said, that it's, it's open to mountain biking and equestrian and hiking. Um, that's a great example of a diverse use. Um, so there is guidance on the Federal Highways RTP website and also within our manual for more detail about that. That's all the questions we have right now. Oh wait, sorry, <laughs> got one more in. Good. Could a planning study be eligible if it informs design and construction of elements also to be funded by this grant? For example, if they wanted to do a trail assessment to identify needed amenities, such as wayfinding, water fountains, benches, et cetera, and then the project also included the design and construction of items that were identified in the assessment, would that be eligible? That's a really good question. Um, tip it, under the regulations for the RTP program, feasibility studies can be eligible. We just typically have such a fairly low apportionment available compared to the competitiveness of, of interest that we have not currently opened feasibility studies as a, a category for funding. Um, so I welcome you to reach out and give us a little bit more detail on recreation grants at dcr.virginia.gov email, um, and we can look into that. Sometimes we do have to reach out to federal highways to talk through different scenarios as well. Um, so we we do want projects that are that we can feel sure can be done within that three-year project period um, so the other thought that i have is it would depend on how long your feasibility study process would take all right thank you next question is can this funding be used to construct a sensory trail um i i believe it would be um if it's for different amenities that that help with um that, that may cross over into like the educational category in some ways, but we we do have a project ongoing that is is it, it involves that um, different QR codes and different ways to use technology on the trail. Um, but we we definitely do want to encourage those kind of creative options to increase accessibility and and use through the greater community. Um, so not not to push off a direct answer, but again, if if you would like to email us some more details, we can look into that more specifically to answer it in more detail. Can the funds be used to create a turning lane into the parking lot? I assume at a trailhead. Uh, currently, they don't have access from the road. Um, there's actually a program through VDOT, which is called the Recreational Access Road program that DCR does do some um, consultation on with VDOT. Um, so I, I would recommend that when it comes to road work, that can be a little complicated and pricey for this kind of program. So I, I would recommend researching the recreational access road program and reaching out to your regional VDOT coordinator for more information on that one. All right, next question. Is there any benefit for a locality to partner with a nonprofit on an application? Um, so this is a rather lengthy application and I know that some localities don't have dedicated grant staff. So um, we do often see multiple partners coming together for the planning and, and different sections of the application process, including nonprofits. And that would be fine. We just need to make sure that we're very clear about who the grant recipient will be. Um, and then on top of that, it can be good if you can leverage funding and, and, and do some stacking of funds if, if that's an option. Yes, um, we do encourage those partnerships as long as the different roles are pretty clearly defined. Yeah, and I would just add that we'll talk about the scoring criteria that are going to be used this grant round and encourage you to take a look at those. There are a, a few items that are in that scoring criteria that, that may benefit a partnership like you've described, um, and they're all outlined there. 
All right, there's a few more questions still in here. So the, the next one is, is trail wayfinding an eligible project type? Not sure if that would fall under a trailhead facilities eligibility. Um, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, wayfinding. Is trail wayfinding, would that be an eligible project? Um, it would be if it's, if it's signage and increasing the safety and usability of the trail. I would encourage to also think about different amenities along with that um, in, in case you need like rest areas, benches, picnic facilities, um, kiosks, parking, that kind of thing. They are all eligible components, but I would be interested to know more about like what the final outcome would be. Um, so if you're combining wayfinding with rehabilitating a trail, uh, that does sound like a good project that would that would fit under it. And we do have some wayfinding specific projects like that from the past. Yes. All right, next question. Uh, when will funding be available to the grant awardees? Um, so as discussed in the timeline, we're looking at an authorization before the end of the federal fiscal year from Federal Highways, which is September. So then at DCR, we would release the subgrantee agreements um, typically by early October. And, and that would be the time when you when you get the grant agreement, from DCR is when the project is, is truly launched and official to start. All right, next question. Their proposed project is listed in the 2018 Virginia Outdoors Plan. Is there a more current Virginia Outdoors Plan? Good question. That is a document that's required by Land and Water Conservation Fund to be updated every five years. So we are in progress here in PRR with working towards the 2023 VOP. And, and we'll talk about the, the VOP a little bit later here. Um, but yes, the 2018 is the current one to, um, to refer to. All right, and then one more question as of now, can they split the funds between two projects if, it, if it's all included in the scope of work? Um, we do have people apply sometimes for like different trail phases. Um, so if that's pretty clearly defined and there's reasoning that's that's logical for why it would it would kind of be two separate sub projects, um, you're welcome to email us a, a scenario of, of what you're looking at and we can evaluate that more closely. But but we do frequently have different phasing happening for the larger trail connections. Yes. All right, that's all the questions we have right now. Um, um, and Kelly, I'm going to go ahead and just show the website real quick um, yep, before you. you jump into the application so they know where to, to access that. So you can Google DCR P, um, RTP, um, but, but this is the website here. Um, and this is everything that you need to know about the RTP, the manual grant application, the certification form, and the scoring criteria are all available as, as a link download. And then um, all the different documents and forms that you'll be using if your project is authorized are also available here, as well as our contact information. Um, so the application manual has been updated for this year, and the application itself is too. So if you've applied before, please do look at these documents carefully and, and note what the different changes are. And Kelly's going to go ahead and, and talk about the application process. Right. You can go. Thank you. Um, so this year for for the applications, um, we've modified it a little bit from last year. If you applied last year, so there's kind of two main forms or files that that you need to fill out. The first is the core application document. It's a, a fillable word document. Um, is, is the bulk of the application. And then there's a separate certification form. So this is a form that you know may need to, to go up the chain to get approval for, for you to submit the application. It has some kind of more general and reporting information that we need at DCR to, to document applications that we receive, but it's information that isn't really necessary for our uh, review committee or to evaluate your project. So that's why we have those those separate forms. So be sure to, to include that certification form as well um, in your in your package whenever you submit that. Um, and then so we're asking if you're able to create a PDF of your Word application when you're finished with it and insert the different attachments at, at the requested 
locations in between the sections of the application. If you don't have the software to be able to do that, you know, we'll, we're certainly understanding of that and, and we can do some of the organizing for you. It, it helps our, our review committee to review the applications when they're kind of in that order. But again, I don't, I don't, it, you're not going to be penalized if you are not able to do that. We just request if you are able to please um, put the attachments in, in those designated sections of the application and, and help us as we, as we do our reviews of them. And for this year, we do want to strongly encourage everyone to please keep to the, the minimum page limit of 45 pages. So that's including your full application documents and the attachments. Uh, we know you have generally probably have a lot more of attachments that you could share with us throughout the application. We indicate some page limits that really we just need the high level. Um, we don't necessarily need the full planning documents, but we may reach out to you and request the full documents. And same with if you're at a stage where you already have construction documents, we're not requesting the full packages this time, just the, a few of the, the key pages so that, that we know how far along you are and get an understanding of the project in order to be able to evaluate it, to be selected for funding. And then we'll follow up if you are selected to um, get those full packages from you um, later on after projects are selected. Now, if you have any issues with these, with these files, please reach out to us. Um, we're happy to work with you and, and find a different uh, either submission method or, or file version that, that works for you if you have any problems with these, these files. And then the last thing I wanna bring your attention to is the manual that, that Crystal pulled up that was posted on our website. There is an appendix at the end, the first appendix A there, it has different application resources that are a little bit of what I'm gonna go through on the next couple slides, but also kind of has helpful tips and, and source links to go to for some of the mappers and just um, useful guidance for to work through as you fill out the application. All right, next slide, please. So start with that application certification form. Um, and this, for the organization name, so this in, in the case of if you are partnering, you're partnering between a locality and a nonprofit, uh, for the organization name here, please select the, the who's going to be the grant holder as the primary recipient on this. And then in you know the other documents and the application form, explain the, the full situation and everyone that's involved for us. And then we also ask for the contact person who's gonna be the main coordinator if you're selected. So you can include additional emails in there if you want uh, additional folks to be contacted of, of the grant award status, but we do ask for the person who will be our primary contact um, because this is someone that we'll, we'll reach out to directly. We do communicate primarily via, via email. So we'll reach out to this person directly and um, please make someone who is able to respond You know, within a a couple day time period to any request that for information that we might have. And I already mentioned that there's some other information on there, the FIPS code and the district for, for your congressional district and things. Those are things we all need for, for our end on reporting. Um, you're not, and help us to know kind of the geographic distribution of the applications and then ultimately selected projects. All right, next slide please. First section of the application. Um, so this uh, just call out a couple of the items there for the project title. Again, if you're, you're selected, we'll have room to, to tweak this. Uh, we encourage you to be descriptive, but not too long, as we said here. Like a four to seven word title is, is good. We use this on a lot of our forms and, and documents that we'll fill out for the selected projects. So that's about a, a good target to have. And for the project category, again, selecting between that a lot of times your project may, may be a little bit on the fence between whether it's a diverse use project or a, a single use non-motorized project. If you're unsure, you can reach out to us and also just know that if you select something and, and in reading your application, we think it's a better fit in another category, we may reach out to you and let you know that, that we moved your project into, into another category because it was a better fit. And then listen at the end of the section for each section are attachments to include there. So for the section A attachments, we asked for some location maps just to help us get an idea of, of where the where the project is within a greater context. And this new, well, not completely new, we didn't ask for it last year, was a, a kind of quick trail layout plan. So if you are putting in a new trail, we want we would like to see a, a you know, it can be a more rough sketch if, if that's all you have available, if you if you're in more of the conceptual stages of where the trail layout is going to go. Um, please in, include that so we get an understanding of, of where that's cited. 
and then also um, new this year compared to last year, we're going to ask we asked for a few photos of the project site or um, kind of any any photos that you think will help tell the story of your project. If, if there are specific elements at a nearby trail that you want to put in, you can include a couple photos of that as well. And then the appraisal that's only required if you are submitting for land acquisition for the appraisal, we do require that the the appraisal is complete before the application is submitted. So that's something that um, you certainly need to be working on now. If and if you're this is something you're considering, we do encourage you, as Crystal said, to reach out to us as soon as possible so we can make sure everything would be in line for to be ready with your your submission. All right, next slide. So these couple items, and Crystal will do a screen share of these in in a minute. So in section B for project need, we ask you to reference some, some different DCR maps and resources that are available. So one being the Virginia Outdoors Plan, of which 2018 is the most recent version. And then another one being the nature-based recreation access model, and a third being the Conserve Virginia Mapper. So Crystal's going to go through each of these right now and share them on the screen. Crystal, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. Sorry, muted, thank you. Um, so the first one I'm gonna show is the Virginia Natural Heritage Data Explorer, or NHDE for short. And this is the website available, and in our appendix, we do show some screenshots as well of this. Um, they do have an upcoming training session if you're interested in learning more about this website and the things that Natural Heritage has available. Um, so do feel free to register for that. So you can click here to the actual mapper and there's a welcoming screen. If you attend a, um, a training, you can get a user login or request creating new account, but you don't have to for the purposes of the application. You can go straight to the map without logging in. And this offers multiple layers that are really helpful. Um, you can look at the terms and disclaimers and just click agree to access it. So like I said, there are many different layers that can be really, really helpful for planning purposes generally, but the ones that we're asking about on the application, um, I'll just walk through these just real quick. This is an Esri based online map. Um, so you may be familiar with it, but otherwise you would go to the layer that you're interested in researching and you would zoom into your project area and then for Conserve Virginia, you can simply click the first layer, which is the general overall Conserve Virginia map. And this is really a combination of all the different categories that then shows you what are priorities for conservation here in the Commonwealth. If you're interested in breaking that down a little bit more, you can use the Identify tool and click there and it'll show you specifically which categories that layer is related to just for more information and you can also toggle this off and turn on the different categories if that's of interest to you um, you can also click here for more information um, and how they created these different layers in the natural heritage division if you're interested for the nature-based recreation access model that's here under conservation planning as well as lots of other really interesting tools and so you have to turn the layer on, and then depending on what your project type is, land-based and or water-based, you would turn those sub-layers on or off. And then it's a sliding scale um, with color coding here, or you can click on the area and it will identify what the class is of, of what the need is. And these are models, um, they're not perfect, and so you can also have the opportunity to explain a little bit more on the application about what the need is. And the same goes for the water-based need. You would turn off land-based and turn on water-based for information there. Um, the other option is that you can use ParkServe, Trust for Public Land. Um, within our scoring criteria, you can see how we break that down. But there are certain things about recreation need that ParkServe, especially for city and urban areas, 
can display a different model, a different source of information that you can use for answering that part of the question as well. Um, and then when it comes to the Virginia Outdoors plan, uh, we have a link available in the, in the resource tools of the manual. And this is the landing page for the 2018 VOP. And there's a lot of really fascinating information here. Um, we also have a mapper attached to that. Um, but you can go through and just look at the PDFs of specific chapters. A lot of the results um, of what the need is and, and demand of recreation is available in the summary of chapter two, Virginia Outdoors Demand Survey. And then for more specific information, there's a chapter about trails and a chapter for each region. Um, so you can go see if your project is a featured project or if there's something mentioned within your region that you can also use for that. We don't need um, screenshots or links um, printed anything for the VOP, but if you could please reference the chapter and the chapter section, um, those are noted on each PDF as well. So um, down here, 13.28 as an example, um, and then the reference that you are specifically applying to your project. Um, I think that's all I need to screen share for now. Crystal, can I pause you for a question? Yes. So there's the, the question of how does one get a project included in the 2023 VOP? That's a great question. Um, so I do oversee and here in PRR we have the responsibility of, of writing the VOP among all of our partners and we we do advisory committees and we reach out and have regional meetings and so typically that's attended by PDC staff as well as um, locality county town city staff have a way of of putting in information to their PDC as well so we've done a lot of that outreach already but we expect to have one more round of um, being able to reach out and and hear what the the regional featured projects are so we do have a running list of that going on um, and and more will be determined over the course of the next year and a half as we put the 2023 BOP together any other questions at the moment um no we're good good for now there's one item that we'll answer later with the um, scoring criteria okay um, so we went through that and we'll go back to the project need. Um, so another section that we do ask about that Kelly referred to is, is the different local and or regional plans that are pertinent to your project. And we do just need the pages that are specific to that language, um, up to four pages from these documents. And you can provide the web link um, so that we can access that for more information if we need it. And every area has a different variety of plans um, between comprehensive plans for counties, cities, and towns, master plans for parks and recreation, and also a lot of people are doing survey work to see what the needs are of the communities. So um, consider all those options when you're answering that question. Um, and then we also have an area to talk about the uniqueness of your project, the potential economic impact, um, and community income levels to have a, a benchmark option of, of presenting the need for the project locally. So please do be detailed and cite those sources within your application. This is uh, largely to help the committee understand the big picture and know more about your specific situation and need. Uh, we do have a section about population served and we are interested to know if the project will be a new opportunity within a 10 minute walk and or 10 mile drive. Um, if that is not completely applicable, you can provide a narrative to explain how, the, how your area is underserved for trail opportunities. We also ask about equitable experiences. So please do consider users with different types of disabilities. Somebody was mentioning a project about sensory components. Uh, there are a lot of um, new and upcoming opportunities for increasing the use of trails for people with all abilities. Health disparities, there's some different information with the Virginia Department of Health that you could look into and provide citations for. And we have an appendix within the manual that can link you to some of those different sources. 
And then the committee does also consider what has the public involvement been, what feedback has been received, what was the outcome, um, and please do describe what kind of public hearings or meetings you've had about that and what the process has been for the public to have opportunity to share what their ideas are. So these are some different options for that. Um, but do please note that you will have to have at some point um, in the process during preliminary engineering, if not before, to have an official 30-day public comment period. And we have more details about how to do that in the environmental review guidance on our website. Project readiness is, is pretty important to evaluate as well. Like I said, this is limited to a three-year project period. And we the committee does want to have some understanding that you are ready to launch on, on the project. And there's certain criteria within the financing that you have to show some financial movement um, three months after project initiation, if at all possible. So part of the different components of us being able to see the project readiness is that you have the right of way control. We do need documentation about that, um, especially if it's not direct ownership. We need to know how long that right of way is available. Um, and as we discussed earlier, nonprofits must include a letter of support with their application from the local government and from the landowner. For the schedule section, please be as detailed as possible for both the preliminary engineering and construction phases. Um, remembering that it's a three-year project period. We do have the opportunity for extensions if we have specific reasoning, um, but we do try to keep it within that three years as best as possible. And then for construction drawings, these can come along later, but if you do already have those drafted or at a place for review, um, those can be attached or you can let us know what the expenses and timeline will be during the preliminary engineering phase because RTP can fund these design and or engineering plans if necessary. All right, so then section D is about the environmental analysis. Like I said, everything, because it's federal funding, has to be done to the standard of the NEPA and also the state review environmental impact procedures. So at the time of application, this does not yet have to be fully complete. This can be done in that preliminary engineering phase. It can be done in-house with a consultant. Um, just please have an estimate of how long that will take and how much it may cost if you want to put that as a reimbursement option on RTP. So you can provide a description of any correspondence with those interagency partners if it's already been completed. Examples of that include Virginia Department of Historic Resources, DEQ, um, as well as Department of Wildlife Resources and Fish and Wildlife Service for Rare Threatened Endangered Species and Division of Natural Heritage. So please do see the Environmental Review Guidance document on our website. Um, that is guidance and subject to change um, if anything happens federally, but that's a good place to start and see what all is involved with that. As for the permits, those don't need to be in place until construction, but please do give us some verification that you have considered what permits will be needed. They're very specific to project type and environmental um, factors on the site um, and incorporate that process of permitting um, in your schedule and budget. Crystal, can I stop you there? There's a question yes. about the environmental review. It is the categorical exclusion option available? Yes, it is. And actually, frequently, the Recreational Trails Program projects are eligible for categorical exclusion. However, we have to prove that by getting all of the different agency correspondence officially from them saying that it's not expected to have a negative impact. So along with our website, I'll go ahead and show you real quick. Um, here on the RTP DCR website, we have the categorical exclusion determination form. And that's a way to eventually, um, well, you have to download it, but that's a way to show your correspondence with all those different components and agencies. Um, and then here within the manual, excuse me. It's at the bottom of the list. Christine. It is at the bottom. Okay, so 17 is the environmental review guidance that has been updated as recently as possible. Again, things may be subject to change occasionally federally and within the state, 
but, um, but this does give you a good overview, um, a checklist of all the different entities that need to be contacted, either through yourself, your staff, or a consultant. Um, and we do need to receive a PDF here at DCR to review. And then we make the recommendation to Federal Highways of whether we think this is a categorical exclusion. And then they have the final authority to verify that. They being the Federal Highways Administration will sign the form and, and will be able to tell you, okay, the, the environmental review is done. Here's the conclusion. And now you can move forward with construction plans. So the finding here of, of CADEX or, or any of the other options is what basically breaks the project, um, completes the preliminary engineering phase, and then you can enter construction once Federal Highways has authorized that. So it's it's quite a process. It can be intimidating, but we've, we've made it as clear as possible, and we're grateful that we have a pretty easy CADEX form for summarizing all of that. Okay, one more question on this topic. Are you familiar with the Center for Urban Habitat and would a 365 page report from them su suffice for the environmental analysis? Honestly, right offhand, I'm not familiar with them. Um, so if you could email us a link and, and what that would include, um, I've not yet seen that under RTP. So um, yeah, feel free to email us more information about that and I can give you a, a more defined answer. Okay. All right, so the next section here, uh, section E, management operations and maintenance. There's just one question here, but I did wanna call out, just be sh sure to answer each of the bullet items there. Um, within the, the scoring and evaluation, you will be evaluated on kind of each of those items separately. So be sure to address all of those within that, that question. All right, next slide, please. So section F for your budget, um, you know, Crystal has already been talking and we'll further discuss them to, towards the end of our presentation too about the different phases uh, and what items are kind of eligible within each of the phases of, of an RTP grant. Um, so when you're completing your budget that you're submitting with your application, we do ask that you kind of be as detailed as you, as you can be for the level of the project that you're at. You know, if you're, you're in kind of a preliminary scoping phase, you might not be as detailed as if you're ready for construction. And we understand that, but we do want as much detail as possible. Um, so we, it helps us understand your project readiness and then also helps us understand and make sure that, you know, the funds that you're requesting match up with what what you're planning to do and, and we don't have a big disparity there now of course we know that in most of your cases the funds that you're going to be requesting for the through this grant do will not fund your full project um, we we know that and we understand that um, but we want to make sure uh, that that we're not overshooting too much and, and perhaps we may reduce the scope specifically for just the rtp grant if that ends up being the case in which rtp is but a, a very small portion of the whole project that you're that you're working on um, so please include the items listed here if you know if they're applicable to your your project all of your design work the environmental analysis if you do need to hire a consultant or other folks to work with you on that you can include those costs in your budget and the permitting and then that your bidding process and that's something that can fit into either uh, the engineering or the construction phase kind of depending how your project is scheduled and then the construction details is, is what we'll really be looking at um in in detail there and the the last item there about including a narrative so that make sure because there, there's some evaluation points for that as well to include a, we don't just want the numbers we want a description of how this budget was estimated so you know if you have in-house folks that are working on it or if you've had an estimate created by an engineer we just want to know where you know what what efforts have been done to create this budget um, and know that the, the costs are reasonable there. All right, next slide, please. So I think this is the next question within that section. We ask about your fund sources and then your financing. So to look at those separately, so the, the 
first item there, we want to know how you'll cover that that 20% share that you're ultimately responsible for. So that's if you know you had that hundred thousand dollar project, the twenty thousand dollars that that you're kind of always going to be on the on the hook for, or if you're using twenty thousand dollars of of volunteer labor, of donated materials, of admin costs, any of those. So we want to understand how you have that that 20% contribution in place. Now if you are using other grants to to cover that we ask for you to provide the um we'll ask you to provide that agreement i think in the application we just ask for the information on it um but we will need that that full documentation if you are selected and, and move forward to make sure there's no conflicts rtp is pretty flexible compared to some other fund sources as far as what grants and things can be used as a matching share but there are you know there may be some specifics of of your other fund source that are in conflict or perhaps rtp is in conflict with your other fund source you know either way so we'll we'll ask for that um and again, this is where it's important to call out any, you know, non-cash fund sources that you're going to be using. So we get those into the project agreement um, and those are able to be used as you go forward. So if if in doubt um, you think a donation might come through, we encourage you to include that on the application so we can keep that documentation going is much easier um, and more likely to be approved than than if we try to add it in afterwards. And then please just be, you know, open and honest with us. If you do have funding gaps, please indicate those in the application. It does not mean that it's it's a definite like no go. There there's scoring items that you'll, you know, the score will be reduced if you don't have the full funding for that that match share available. But um, we ask that you you let us know the full situation that that you're in. And then the second half of that, the financing the project. So that that isn't exactly showing us that you have you know, funds to cover your full project cost, it is showing us that you can cover the costs of your project as they come up, knowing that you will get periodic reimbursements from the RTP project. So we did have a question. Um, I'm looking in the, the question box here. So there was, this is related to, there's a question on how frequently that fund disbursements were made. So if their project was only gonna take nine months, could they receive the, the reimbursements on a monthly basis? So to kind of answer that question is that as you go along the project, you can submit reimbursement requests to us monthly. So basically you have to incur the expense. So once you have the expense, and I apologize because we'll go into this more later too, um, you have to incur the expense, you have to have proof that you paid the expense. So the check has to actually clear. Um, and then you, and then we have a few other paperwork forms for you to fill out and submit those to us, and then we can process it. Uh, we at DCR prepare forms, submit it to Federal Highways, they send the money back to DCR, and DCR sends it to you. So it's a bit of a process. So it's not, um, it's not very quick. It, I would say, recently, it's been taking about two months for that process. But before, we've we've had it take as little as three weeks for the process. It kind of just depends on on different things that get held up, and and you know, with both federal and state fiscal year year changeover sometimes there's additional delays but i would say generally it's probably about a two a two month turnaround would be a safe estimate from when you submit to us and when you would receive those funds so there is a bit of delay so in this in your application we're asking how you have a proof that you can kind of carry those expenses for that period of time before you're going to get the reimbursements um in and you know, if you expect the expenses to come in in one big chunk, if you when you're constructing and you're going to get the hundred thousand dollar bills at a time, can you can you carry that until you get the next reimbursement versus or if, depending what your um, arrangement is with your your contractors or how you expect the expenses to come, it may be more uh, even distribution. But we ask for for proof of, of that ability as well. All right, next slide, please. All right, so evaluation and scoring. Um, this is, it was revised this year, but however, I would say not significantly from last year. There are definitely several items in there that are revised, weighted a little differently, a few new items. So we encourage you to take a look at that uh, as you're preparing your application and, and get an idea of, of whether your project will be competitive or not. Um, our process going forward, all these applications that, that you submit by May 26th, we'll do a quick review to make sure they're, they're eligible RTP projects, and then we send them 
send all of those to our advisory committee who will spend the month of June reviewing all of your applications, scoring them using this criteria, and then we get back together, our advisory committee discusses the, the projects and we, we take a, a big table of the scores and average them, um, and then they recommend the, pro the top scoring projects for funding. Um, so that's a little bit bit of our process. I wanted to see there was a question uh, in here that I don't think we answered yet about evaluation. Uh, the question was if um, a project was in the Virginia Outdoors plan, if that would um, give it a preference in the scoring. And you'll see on the very top of the scoring criteria, there are a few points awarded if, if the project is a future project within the outdoors plan. However, it's not significant. So I would certainly um, not say that if your project is not a future project, it, it won't be selected. It's a very, very low amount of points compared to the, you know, what's available for the full project, but it is, it does add a, add a couple there. All right, so we'll stop here now. I know some questions have came in that we didn't answer yet, so we'll take a, a look at those and I encourage you to insert any more questions that you have on the that application and evaluation and we'll, we'll answer them. Um, I do see the one question I don't think we covered. If our nonprofit and grant requester has the know-how to do the design work and has the volunteers to do the design work, can we bill that? as part of the 20% match we need to cover, but it's not particularly money spent, but human hours. And that does make sense. So, so you would need to forecast that and we can use the, um, the accepted volunteer rate, but we would need time sheets, well, time logs of specifically how many hours had been um, worked on the project specifically. So, you can submit those volunteer logs, or um, if there's an actual dollar amount available for that person's expertise, such as their salary, um, or a letterhead from the nonprofit or, or entity about what the value of that work is, um, then with proper documentation, we can include that. But please, as Kelly said earlier, please do um, estimate that so that we can tell the federal highways that there will be volunteer or donated time or administrative time as part of the project component. All right, Crystal, then I wanted to go back to, there was an earlier question we didn't answer. It was a follow-up to the question about having kind of two different projects within one grant application. So the, the person responded saying it would be building two different sections of, of trail trail within the county, but they're separate. Mm -hmm. um, could they apply as that that is one RTP project or they're in separate locations, I should say. Um, they can, but I will just note that during that environmental analysis section, um, if they have different environments and if they are separated, please make that really clear. Um, you, you have to be pretty detailed about what your project components are when you reach out to those agencies for their review. Um, so do make that clear on any maps and in your scope of work. Um, give them a nomenclature that makes sense of either like, you know, section A and section B or the trail names. Um, and it, it depends on what your total project cost is. It, it might be to meet that minimum $50,000 um, section, but you may want to consider just doing one thing at a time. So again, we can talk to you more specifically offline about that. Um, it is eligible, but there are just different considerations to, to factor in there. All right, next question. Do the match eligible components of the project have to be implemented during the grant period, or can they count funding being utilized now towards that that supports the, the grant objectives? Well, that's a good point too. So per the regulations, there is an option to use costs incurred um, up to 18 months prior to the project authorization. Okay, so we're looking at like September, October authorization. So subtract, go back 18 months or to be safe one year. Um, and if you have proper documentation to provide a value of that and provide um, you know, proof of everything, it is possible. We have um, advocated for that with projects in the past successfully, 
So do place a narrative um, about that in your budget for the application and an estimate of how much you would be um, applying to it. But donate at materials, donate at time, volunteer hours, those are all options if presented up front. And preliminary engineering costs for that fact, you know, if, you, if you're already pretty much shovel ready, but you put a lot of energy and expenses and payments into the PE phase, um, we have done that before as well. So it's, it's flexible with the proper documentation. Next question, how many applications are submitted each year for the non-motorized program? Um, well, I can say offhand that last year we got, what, 32 applications? And non-motorized and diversified were about equal. Um, so I think last year we received like 15 or 16 estimated in that category. Um, so, so it is rather competitive and our scoring committee um, are all trail users and many of them have been on the committee for, for some time and some of them are new, um, but they helped re review the scoring criteria we take an average of everything and, and we are as fair about the process as we can be. All right, is scoring and selection simply numbers based or does the committee weigh other items? Um, it, it is largely numbers based um, in the sense of what's laid out, if I can pull it up. Um, in the scoring criteria, um, you, can, you can look at that. Um, but we, we do have a pretty wide range. So each committee member, as well as um, Kelly and myself combined, enter, enter this and, and document it. And then we take the average of all the committee members and the one column for DCR to make an average for each project. I will note though, that at the end of the scoring criteria here, there are committee discretionary points for a few categories. Um, so, you can you can read through those. I know it might be kind of small, but but the committee, not DCR, they they have the option to provide up to nine total, um, which is not frequent that that happens, but they can they can do that. So um, please do read through the scoring criteria if it's of interest, and if you have any detailed questions about that, you can reach out to us. All right. Where can they find information regarding previously funded projects? Um, actually. We report each year to both um, Federal Highways Administration of, of newly authorized projects as well as applications received. And then American Trails um, has information historically by different states and we report to them annually. You can go to their website and they have updated their website a little bit. Um, let me see. It is available here. They have a database for both photos as well as each state, uh, but they just changed this. So um, they, they do have a list of um, previously funded projects within Virginia. All right, can the 20% match be the same match used for another federal grant such as lap or it says thud earmark i'm sorry i'm not familiar with this so please um, correct me. so if you do have another grant involved in the specific project we do need to um, see the grant agreement if it's live or at least have a link to learn more about it there are more grant programs opening up um, across the nation and um, and so it's possible to stack funds legally, the Land and Water Conservation Fund plus the Recreational Trails Program can stack, um, but we have to be very careful about our documentation through the process to make sure there's no possibility for like, quote, double dipping, like one project component being charged to two different programs. Um, we all know we have good intentions, but the documentation can get a little complicated when there's multiple funding sources. The Transportation Alternatives program run through VDOT is also also eligible to stack with RTP if the stars align and the project components are um, eligible for both programs. So if you have a unique circumstance um, and want to talk about that some more, again, uh, we can talk offline about your particulars, 
Um, but there is one caveat also that only up to 95% of the total project can be sourced from federal funds. So um, that's the, the general statement and, and we'll go from there if there are federal grants, we can talk to you more about that. All right, and then one more question here. Can a project be on private land, for example, at a private college that allows public access? Um, we would have to know what the agreement is and if that public access is limited in any ways. So typically not, but it, it does depend on those caveats within the right of way description. Uh, we do want to have an understanding of how long the right of way is in place, if there's any limited hours or if any of the, any fees related to the use of that trail, um, and would probably want to have some communication with said university to make sure they understand about the commitments involved. So that would be something with a follow-up partner team conversation, probably. That's all the questions right now. All right, so if you're still hanging in there, we still have a lot of attendees, thank you. Um, we're gonna talk about project administration. So this is if your project is selected and moves forward for funding. Um, we want you to know um, generally what you're getting into. Um, so we'll go through these different ones, um, some of which we've already touched on, but what you'll receive um, is notification that we are sending your project on for authorization request to Federal Highways, i.e. notified of the committee results of, of what scored highest and is recommended for funding. The DCR staff, myself or Kelly or both, will come to perform an on-site pre-inspection and go over the project details, make sure that the site is, um, is, is feasible for what the plan is and, and be able to have an open conversation about how to move forward. We'll from there finalize that scope of work statement that we'll submit to the federal highways. And then we, in August, September, we'll be um, working closely with federal highways to go through obligating all of the funding correctly per project. So please do not begin billable work. Um, kind of pause for a second um, until the agreement is signed. So technically DCR is the grantee and then all of the applicants are sub-grantees. So we get authorized from Federal Highways and then we turn that into a project agreement laying out all the different conditions and expectations um, for both DCR and the project sponsor. And then you would have that signed and DCR would sign that agreement as well. So we now authorize the projects as a full three-year PE and construction phase instead of um, kind of two separate phases but we do have some certain cutoffs for when we can begin construction. Um, so do keep in mind that typically people do kind of 18 months PE, 18 months construction, um, but that is flexible as long as you're on track to finish that component um, as agreed upon. We cannot start build, building and bidding until, like I described earlier, the NEPA documentation um, including the categorical exclusion form is approved by Federal Highways. We also need verification that there will be no other preliminary engineering reimbursements so that we can keep that separated with the construction phase. Before you post the bid for construction, DCR will briefly review those to make sure that you have given notice that this does have federal funding involved. Um, if you're not able to move forward into construction within two years, this would be in the green agreement, then there's the possibility that without justification or explanation, you may have to return the RTP funding to DCR to return to federal highways, because that will look like to them that the project's not going to be completed. Um, so it's important to know that you can, you can keep on track and keep a good timeline for these projects. So I already discussed the environmental analysis um, earlier. The resources are on our website, um, including that form. And, and like I said, most of the time, these are categorical exclusion projects, although we have had a couple environmental assessments. And we do sometimes get feedback from like Fish and Wildlife Service or, or Department of Historic Resources that sometimes a survey is needed. 
Um, and then at that point, we could do an amendment on the project um, to show the need for that. So um, please review that guidance and, and plan for the time that it takes, usually 30 days per, um, most agencies turn around a response within 30 days. Um, so consider that. And like I said, the public comment period and then federal highways will review and authorize these prior to construction. Um, also consider the detail of, of where you're at with your project. Are you still in scoping? Are you in the design phase? Uh, what's your forecast of permits needed and will those be obtained during construction or beforehand? Um, like we talked about, the right-of-way is secured and you're, you have your engineering and plan, especially for bridges and, and different complicated components. Um, please do consider that both in your um, in your timeline as well as your budget. And then for the construction phase, uh, like I said, we have to close out kind of the, the preliminary engineering phase, make sure the permits are obtained. And we, we do like to have a copy of the permit, just the approval state um, statement from that said agency, just in case that we're asked about it for, for files. Um, and then DCR will review the plans briefly and bid documents just for compliance to RTP, not official guidance or engineered review. I'll give it back to Kelly here. Sure, so just talk about pre procurement for a minute. So since this is federal funding, um, there's a few additional requirements beyond what you may already have to um, what the procedures you already have to follow through the Virginia Public Procurement Act. So the, the main things to note here, um, so when bidding for construction or when when bidding and all, um, you have to receive two bids. So if your state, the state and local procurement procedures may allow certain circumstances in which you could um, make a selection with just receiving one bid, but the, the federal fund source does require two bids to be received. Um, so just keep that in mind as you go through your process and you are able, to, you can do outreach and, and you know, send your, your documents to potential bidders. Um, so that's, that's one item to, to note. Another item is that Buy America comply or applies to to this grant. So that is specifically for iron, iron and steel products. So there's a limit of $2,500 of non-compliant iron or steel that can be on the project. Um, and if you have iron and steel components to your project, we ask for a certification on that. We have a, a form on our website um, for that to, to certify that, that that is the case. And, and this is something that specifically applies to um, these these federal grants, and it's uh, a little different than than Buy American, which applies to direct federal procurements. Um, so we have some information on that in the the procurement procedures document that is located on that that list of documents on the website that that Crystal brought up. And then the third item that's a little different than than your gen, the general Virginia procurement standards is that there is a requirement to that disadvantaged business enterprises and small women-owned and minority-owned businesses have the opportunity to compete for these for contracts funded through the program. Um, so that does not mean that you necessarily have to receive bids from, from these businesses, but there are efforts that you need to go through to ensure that um, they have that these businesses have the opportunity to view your bid and opportunity to apply. So we outline also some procedures to follow through for that within those um, that procurement procedures document. Um, throughout your process, we do request some of the your procurement documentation to be submitted to DCR, um, namely um, your bid notice. We we do a quick review of that to make sure that there's a, a statement again in that document that has to be included in your bid notice informing folks that this project is funded by RTP. Um, and then other procurement documents will be on you to keep the records with your project files and, and DCR or Federal Highways may request those, you know, anytime within the, the document retention period that we have for the project. All right, next slide, please. So we'll get back to the reimbursements. I know we've touched on these different times throughout the throughout our talk today. Um, whenever we, when you get to the point of, of processing reimbursements, what we're looking for is documentation of the expense, so the invoice from from 
someone from your contractor and then documentation that you paid that expense normally that is cleared checks that we get we also do um accept bank statements and then some other kind of uh, entity specific things that if those things aren't available um, you can talk to us so we look for that and then um, in the case of if you are using volunteer labor or something other than than cash to to show your 20 percent match there's different types of documentation we'll need to show that um, in and that's outlined in some of those reimbursement guidance documents that are on on the website but we may need you know additional documentation beyond beyond the invoices and proof of payment when you're using that to show show as your match and then if if there are iron and steel components we need some certificate the buy america certification form so all those things are outlined in the there's a reimbursement procedures or reimbursement guidance i'm sorry i don't remember the title um on our website so we we have those outlined there's an example reimbursement package there's the forms so um if you want to take a look at those and get an idea of, of the type of documentation that we need um that's all all outlined there all right, next slide, please. And Crystal, I don't think you need to share the screen here since this is the list from the, the RTP website that Crystal showed before. Um, so that, again, I just wanted to make sure if we didn't do it earlier, we, we called out where all those, those forms and examples are located. So that list on the website, you know, if we have any updates to the documents, we'll be sure to, to note that um, as, as the year goes on. All right, next slide, please. All right, and one final note on reimbursement. So we do ask if your project is awarded that you submit a reimbursement request once every three months. Um, this, especially, you know, with your first one, depending on the size of your, or the phase of your project that you're in, we are flexible with, with that first one if, if you don't have billable expenses, but we really try to keep all the projects on, on that schedule so that that allows for the delays that may happen on our end or through federal highways and, and we can keep the project in, in active status with them. With the reimbursements, we'll ask you to note when, you know, if, if you're completed all your engineer work and you're ready to move on to constructions, you'll note that with your reimbursement request. That's one way that, you know, you check in with us frequently. Another is quarterly reports. So if you're selected, we do ask folks to submit quarterly reports as well. Um, so that's a, another way that we kind of um, get to know how how your project is is progressing. The reimbursement when when we get it, just you know, so we look at all your documentation, um, make sure everything line everything that is needed is there. We complete a few forms that we have to send to Federal Highways. We do that. They release the funds back to DCR to our finance team here, and then they turn around the the funds to you. So that's why there there can be delays because there's different you know reviews and re approvals at every step of that process. Um, but just so you know, that's that's kind of the overall uh, method. And, and I I believe it, at least as of now, they still they send payments out via direct deposit or um, or check kind of depending on the locality's preferences and through this process if you are approved we'll we'll need information such as your w9 um, and you'll have to register on on sam.gov all right then finally over to project closeout with all of your successful projects um, so when ready for this, all your deliverables and the scope as agreed upon is complete. You will let us know that, we'll let us know, we'll process the final reimbursement um, once we come out and do a site inspection. Now, gen sometimes depending on where your project's at, when, when we last saw the project, we may request you to submit some photos if we're not able um, to get out there quickly enough. Um, but generally we try to make it out and, and do site inspections and, and see what you're able to accomplish. And then also it'll be outlined in the project agreement, but we do ask for a, a report of the of the kind of as built accomplishments um, that we'll keep with all of our, our project records. All right. Crystal. Um, so yeah, again, thank you all for attending this. Um, just keep in mind these are federal funds, so it must be completed to federal standards, and we're here to help you understand what those are. Um, you can also go to the Federal Highways Administration RTP page. They have some pretty 
easy to understand further guidance as well. But that's the purpose of our manual is to help you understand it and kind of interpret all of that. So it is possible to have amendments or extensions and just keep us informed how your project goes once it's selected. Um, like she said, with quarterly reports and, and you can reach out anytime um, for any updates. Um, and per the regs, we do have to have at least 90 days prior to the agreement expiration if we, if we need extensions. Um, so, so we need to know about your project so that we can tell Federal Highways about your project if they have any questions. Um, we are here to help make your project successful. We've had tons of su successful projects here in Virginia, and uh, we're, we're really grateful that so many people are interested in this program. So we will um, pause again for any questions, and feel free to email us afterwards as well. Were there any new ones in? Um, not yet. If you want to go ahead for the next slide, and then I'll read out any that come in afterwards. Um, thank you. So here at DCR, there are some other grant opportunities that we in PRR and our colleagues in the Land Conservation Office oversee. Um, so we, we do oversee the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That's National Park Service funding, 50-50 match reimbursement. We did just close and um, move forward the projects from the March 22 round. And that was exciting because it was both for acquisition and development projects. So we got um, a lot of a lot of good um, projects submitted for that, and they're at the National Park Service for their review. You can learn more about it on this website, and I'm the primary contact for that program. Um, if you ever have any questions about conversions or LWCF properties in your locality, you can also reach out to me. And then the Virginia Land Conservation Fund, VLCF, is Virginia funds from General Assembly for multiple categories um, of protection, easements and or acquisition of open spaces and parklands that Kelly Seaton and myself help advise um, about that category, then also lands of historic or cultural significance farmlands and forests, and natural areas. And Sue Bulbakaya is the direct contact for that program, and her information is here. Um, so thank you so much for your interest here, and I'll just pause one more time for any questions. Um, yep, no questions have come in. All right. All right. Well, yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We will we'll stay on for a few more minutes here till our allotted time um, in case any more questions come in and try to answer those after we, we finish here. But we are very excited to see all your project applications come in. This is an exciting time of the year for us. As Crystal mentioned, if you have any further questions, please reach out to us at this email, the recreation grants at dcr.virginia.gov. We both see that and we'll respond to you as quickly as we can. If you have any um, questions or you prefer to talk through them via phone, feel free to call me at, my, at the number on the screen. I'll be your kind of primary point of contact and, and we'll bring Crystal in when we, when we need her to. Um, all the documents that Crystal shared are available on the website posted on the screen. Again, you can follow that, that lengthy website link or I generally use my search engine to just search DCRRTP every time I pull it up. And, but um, again, I'll look and see if any questions are in here before we end. Oh, we have a question, Crystal. Will the LWCF for development be available due again? Um, yes, we are. We are pretty hopeful about continued funding. Um, actually, we have not quite gotten notification of the federal fiscal year 22 apportionment, but thanks to the Great American Outdoors Act and a lot of support for the program, um, we, we do expect to have consistent um, funding available. Approximately, I've been told an estimate is, is six million dollars, um, give or take. So, um, we do have much more funding available there, and if your project is not selected for RTP, please do consider LWCF because trails are eligible development projects. We um, did receive a lot of um, really good proposals and, and projects, so I, I do want to continue having the acquisition development and combination option for that program, especially with so much funding available. Um, so we are hoping to hold that annually, likely this winter or coming spring window. 
All right, I'm going to stop recording um, and then if you will continue to field the questions um, and then if you want to unmute and ask your question, we can do that too. So I'm going to end the recording now.